I was asked to, you want to hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Sorry, cameraman, I can't stay still, so that's <coughs> Um, all right, so I was asked to say something about tax. I was just putting together a few notes a couple of minutes ago. This is a bit last minute, so please excuse me. I had to rearrange these PowerPoints from an old presentation, and these come from my uh, lectures that went for about four or five hours. We got 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm sure you guys will get it because I was just teaching that to third year econ students, and they're not too bright. You guys are as well, so we can do four or five hours in a couple of minutes, I'm sure. Um, I, I didn't get time to be very mad and the title. Bad. All right, so uh, a bit of some context setting. All right, yeah, that's just me creating an excuse for why this is going to be disjointed. Um, some context setting about tax in Australia, just a few little bits and pieces. Firstly, if you haven't had a chance, if you're an economist or you get in economic debates a lot, go to budget.gov.au. Go to budget paper one, budget statements five and six. It has all of the data that people spend their time arguing about, pretending they don't know the answers to. It's really easy to find. Once you know how to find it, other people are going to think you're a genius because for some reason they haven't worked out how to use budget.gov.au or the internet. So it's a great way of tricking people into thinking you're smarter than you are if you know that website. And this is some stats we can just get from there. Here's some info in case you run across what our tax system looks like in Australia. We have over 100 taxes in Australia, but nearly all of the revenue comes from the Big Ten. And specifically, you can see these big three really are the ones making the money. Income tax, company tax, which is effectively just a withholding tax on income, so another income tax, and the GST. Um, of course, the income tax is progressive tax. You guys know what I mean by progressive tax? Great, can you tell me? Tell me. Well, in scale, the, the more you earn, the higher a marginal rate you pay. Yes, yeah, so it's not that you pay more when you earn more, it's that you pay more as a percentage of your income as you earn more. Progressive is the opposite way around. Uh, most taxes we think about think it's progressive tax, that's because we normally think about the income tax, which is by far the biggest. And it is very progressive. The rich pay most of that. Um, but not all of these taxes are progressive. One of these is potentially proportional, which would be GST. I mean, people try to say GST is regressive because poor people have a lower marginal rate of savings. That argument misunderstands that we live over an entire lifetime where we save in one part and dissave in another. You don't save just so you can burn money. You save so you can spend it later. So over the course of your life, your consumption will equal your income. Consumption tax is about the closest you can get to the proportion. Anyway, that's not very interesting. There's a big, there's a couple of progressive ones up here, but there's one that is far more regressive than any of the others. Just shout out. Yeah, oh, these two straight away. <laughs> 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 it's it's um, Individual income tax. Sorry. Individual income tax. Regressive. regressive. Individual income tax is the most regressive tax of these ones. Um, so sin taxes. Sin taxes are regressive because and this is thing to say, but poor people sin more. Right? I, I don't think it's sinning, but you know, the, the syntax is the cliche, the gambling, the drinking, the smoking, the <laughs> what have you. Uh, so those ones, tobacco, petrol, um, alcohol, these ones are regressive, but the tobacco tax is actually so regressive, and this is really rare around the world and throughout history. Not only in tobacco tax do poor people pay a higher percentage of their income, they actually pay more in dollar terms, which I think is quite astounding. But anyway, this was a bit of a context that I'll let you see what Australian tax system looks like. Um, what, I was, what this is normally a part of is a lecture on dynamic tax analysis, uh, where I start with telling you about how static tax analysis works. You just take the rate times the base. So if your base is income and income tax, the base is income. If the rate is 10% and your income is 100, the tax is $10. Simple stuff, right? Now, the, the key assumption in static tax analysis is that, and if I go again, back. The key assumption is that there is no elasticity. People don't change their behavior. Right now, as soon as you say that, it should be obvious that it's obviously not right. I mean, where in economics, where in the world can you change incentives and no one changes their behavior? Right, so you should know that that's pretty obviously wrong. And here's an example. If you double com company tax from 30 to 60, you actually expect the revenue to go from 68 to 136. No one actually changes that. Except amazingly, the US Congressional Budget Office who have done wonderful research about how the elasticity is somewhere between 0.4 and 1.4, and in every estimate they release, they assume it's zero. Which is astounding, because then of course all the media just reports exactly what they've done. It becomes a fact, because it's been said by the CBO. And they look crazy for disagreeing with the CBO, even though the CBO disagrees with the CBO. But anyway, <laughs> so as soon as you know that people change behavior, you're smarter than what most American government statistics are doing. And smarter than what the Australian Treasury does. The UK Treasury is a, a notable exception there, they, they don't get this wrong. So, I mean, 
this is the uh, incentive point. We understand in most other instances that if the government puts a tax on something, they, they're trying to discourage it. I mean, the cliche thing, like, you want less smoking, you tax it. You want more education, you subsidize it. That's it. You might not want to tax and subsidize it, but you, you get the thinking, right? You get what they're going for. By far the biggest tax in this country is a tax on success. By far the biggest subsidy we have in this country is a subsidy for not making it, for, for failure or for laziness or for whatever reason you didn't make it. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't help those people, but you've got to pause for a second and think, all right, by far the biggest tax, tax that raise 70, 80% of the money in this country, is a tax on success. By far the biggest spending measures is a subsidy on not success. If you think incentives change behavior, that's... Anyway, we're looking at the income tax here, and if a tax on smoking might increase smoking, tax on income might change income. Now, that's technical stuff, we haven't got time for that. That's... Anyway, you guys will just look at that and instantly understand it anyway, so I don't have to explain it. Um, when you think about how it changes behavior, the first thing that uh, people think of is people might work a different amount, right? That's a cliched labor supply elasticity. Actually, that's not a big part of the story. Labor supply can actually be quite elastic in a lot of instances. We know it's fairly elastic for married women for some reason. I don't, I don't speculate, we can work that out. But uh, other groups is quite inelastic. Um, because we actually have two effects going on here, and I don't have time to go into this, but the economists amongst you might know about the Slutsky equation, which makes first year economists giggle. But, uh, okay. You've got two offsetting effects here. The substitution effect, so you tax work, so you do less of it. But an income effect, and that is, you need to make sure you have enough money in your pocket. So if you tax work, you have to work more to be able to keep the same amount of money in your pocket. Which is why this effect actually isn't that big. There are a bunch of other behavioral responses. Uh, and uh, yeah. This is just a bit of anecdotal evidence from the OECD about labor supply. I say the effect isn't that big, but you can still see as the tax on income, it's higher, you can see there's a, a, a negative correlation in the participation rate in the labor force. But, but anyway, that's just anecdotal, I'll just go into that previous point. But this is what I want to get to. Going beyond labor supply elasticities, there's a bunch of other changes, ways that people change their behavior. Tax minimization is where you do it legally. You, you set up trusts, you set up funds. And uh, one wonderful example from this came out of Sweden where they had, uh, when you buy clothes, that's not a tax deduction, it's, it's just consumption. But if you buy clothes that are sufficiently ridiculous, then it counts as a costume, and that's a tax deduction. And that's actually the reason that Abba gave for looking like this. That those outfits are tax deductible. The whole point being, if it's so bad, that no one would think you'd wear them on purpose, then you get to pay less tax. So, but that's a <laughs> business. <laughs> Sorry? For business. Like they're yeah, they, they make money off selling records and they can take off the cost of their outfits off their revenue before they pay tax. Because no one would believe anyone would actually want to look like that. No, the point here is just people change their behavior, right? I, mean, I said at the beginning you should have just believed me straight away. I'm sure you did. But this is another way they change their behavior. They rearrange their tax affairs and if they're rich they pay an account to a lawyer to do it for them. Tax evasion, that's just the illegal version. Uh, the, the economics of crime says what should be fairly obvious. If the benefit from crime goes up, it's more likely to happen. If there's no benefit from crime, it's less likely to happen. And if you keep ramping up tax, then you keep ramping up the benefit from breaking tax law. And we find that uh, Russia had the best example of this. When they, uh, I can't remember, about 10 years ago, I don't know why I'm looking at Austin, but about 10 years ago, they uh, introduced, I think, an 11% flat tax. And uh, they used to have a progressive system going up to 30, with most rates above 11. Uh, and when they introduced the 11 flats, tax revenue went through the roof. And they went, oh great, this is showing people are working harder. And they went and checked and everyone's working the exact same amount. Right? And they hadn't changed their taxing company. But people just started telling the truth. Right? <laughs> that's what happened. People, when it was 30%, it made a lot of sense for rich people to pay someone to hide their money. When it was 11, they said, ah, oh, we'll, we'll just tell you what we've got. And so they started paying their tax. So just another example of a behavioral response. Another one is changing countries. That's a bit dramatic. Less dramatic version is changing states, and you probably have heard of the cliched example about when Queensland got rid of death duties, all the rich old people went up to Queensland, all the other states in Australia had to get rid of death duties. To follow. That's just a, a behavioral response to a tax system. Another story along these lines in Australia that gets less attention, it goes in a different direction. Before a ridiculous high court rule in 97, and the lawyers can tell me I'm wrong later if they want, but I'm right. Uh, before this ridiculous 97 high court ruling, uh, the states used to have petrol tax. 
in Australia. And when the states had petrol tax, the petrol tax rates were held a lot lower. Then the High Court says states can't have it, it went to the federal area. The federal government didn't immediately just rack it up. They just took it over, and everyone thought, oh, that's fair, it makes no difference. The feds will run it and just give the money back. And what happened over the next 15 years is the petrol tax went through the roof, because they could. Because it's harder to move countries than it is to move states. But anyway, the point here is people sometimes move to get away from tax. Um, so you don't have, yeah, the, I don't like this anecdote, the same Bolt uh, refused to race in the UK until they changed their tax system. He says, he only went to the Olympics because they temporarily changed the tax system during the Olympics. Otherwise, a bunch of people weren't going to show up to race in the UK. Um, like Rafael Nadal cancelled a uh, British tournament and went to Germany and started because of the tax rules. And the French are trying an experiment now. And in economics, we don't get to do many experiments on people. We can't just say, look, we're just abolishing welfare for half the country just to see what happens. We're not allowed to do that, right? So we need to wait for natural experiments. And the French have been very obliging. We've got the top marginal tax rate of 75% just so we can see what happens. So I'll tell you what happens in a few years. Um, well, the first thing that happened is a bunch of rich people left France. <laughs> Um, some, to, some go to Russia, interestingly enough. And you can change careers, that, that's a bit complex. Um, the logical consequence of all of these behavioural responses, and I hope you believe me that they, they are very real, and the elasticity is not zero, contrary to what the CBO would say, the logical consequence is that you don't just have a static increase in tax revenue as you put up tax rates. As you keep putting up rates, the marginal amount of extra revenue you get decreases. And here I have to jump forward quickly. To, what do I need to get to? 43. Ah. Start here. So the top story is what the world looks like if you don't think uh, people change their behavior. Right? You put the rates up, the revenue goes up. Don't have to. It makes the maths really easy. Right? Dynamic analysis, this is normally what we're talking about. As you put the rates up, the revenue starts going up slower. The logical consequence, you take this logical to its end. If you put the rates up too much, eventually tax revenue starts going down. And this can seem, to some people it seems really obvious, to some people it can seem counterintuitive. But you think about it, if the tax rate was 100%, what's your incentive to work? Nothing. I mean, the, the idea that you're going to raise a lot of revenue with a 100% income tax rate is kind of bizarre, right? So you're not. So, some people may work for fun and just handle their money to the government. Most people aren't going to work, right? So you get basically zero revenue with 100%. Obviously, if you've got 0% tax, you also raise zero revenue. Somewhere in the middle, you get a number higher than zero. Somewhere in the middle is the highest possible number. We call that the Laffer maximum or the revenue maximizing tax rate. So this is the Laffer curve. It's got a bit of a bad rap. Some people go, oh, the Laffer curve. You believe in that? Oh, well, that was disproved. Well, when, what they tend to say is this happens a lot. You look shocked. Have you never heard someone say that? Oh, I've, I've heard it being used to around. It's just been disproved. The Laffer curve can't be disproved. I mean, it, it, no economist doesn't think it exists. Right? There is a massive debate about its shape. That's what people mean, right? So they, they, basically, what people are thinking is Reagan said the life of maximum was somewhere around here, and they think it was up here, and there was some data that showed Reagan was wrong, and people said, ah, the lack of curve is being disproved. No, no, it's just, it's in a different position to where Reagan thought it was. <laughs> so you can't disprove the lack of curve, and you can have massive debates about what it looks like. And there are people who think the maximum is at 20%, there are people who think it's at 80%. Not even great, right? A lot, a lot of scope for debate, but just make sure you know what the debate is. Laffer didn't think of the idea, by the way. He, he's named after Art Laffer. He wrote it on a napkin at a lunch with Donald, Donald Rumsfeld, I believe, in the 70s. Uh, and they started naming it after him then. But the idea goes back to nearly every decent economist. Adam Smith wrote about it. Keynes wrote about it quite eloquently. I mean, Keynes is wrong. Don't get, me, don't get me wrong. But Keynes himself was a brilliant economist. Right? Don't, don't mix Keynes with Keynesians. I think he'd be embarrassed today if he looked around and saw what people are doing with his name. <laughs> he was still wrong, but you've got to give him more respect. He's right back. Uh, but he goes uh, a lot back a lot further than those guys as well. Ibn Khaldun, the 14th century Islamic scholar, is given credit by Art Laffer. So that's how far back most people go. Uh, but when I was in India early this year, uh, Gacharan Das made a reference to uh, some, some comments in the Mahabharata. I don't know how many people here have read the Mahabharata. Probably not too many. But I went through it after looking at his comments, and it looks like uh, 2,000 years ago, the Hindus beat us all to the, to the gun. And they, they hinted at what we would now call the Laffer Curve. The idea is not controversial. What is controversial is where is the Laffer Curve. So, where is the Laffer Curve? You only need two statistics to know this. Right? There, there is an alpha which 
you don't want me to tell you about it, but thank me. I'm not going to tell you about it. But the, the alpha is actually not something up for debate. It purely falls out of the tax statistics of any country. I don't know if I've got it up here, but the alpha in Australia is two. Don't worry about what that means. The only contested variable is the elasticity of taxable income, which is what we were talking about before with all those behavioural responses. So you add up all the different ways people can change their behaviour, and you can, again, I won't give a lesson on how elasticity is work. I haven't got five hours. Um, but you get at how much people change their behaviour. If you think people change their behaviour a lot, that means the level maximum is low. That means you have to have a low tax rate. And if you raise tax beyond that, you'll get less revenue. If you believe people don't change their behaviour much, then uh, you'll believe you can have a higher tax rate. Where is the... Yeah. If people don't change their behaviour much, you can go further up here. High tax rate and, and raise more money. So, what evidence do we have about what it might be? The UK has given us a wonderful, going back to 21 now. Yes, they gave us a wonderful natural experiment on this just recently. The UK government decided to increase the top marginal tax rate from 40 to 50%. They expected that they're smarter than the US and Australia, so they actually factored in some elasticity, they just factored in a low elasticity. And they expected something like 3 billion pounds. And it turned out they got approximately zero pounds. Well, actually, originally they got 7 billion less than they previously got, but some of that was tax shifting behaviour, so you've got to factor that in. When they did some robust analysis, they found that increasing rate from 40 to 50 raised approximately zero dollars. Now, if you're aware of what's happening in Australia, that, that might be worth remembering. Uh, what falls out of that is an elasticity of about 0.6, and the most left wing tax economists in the world also find an elasticity of about 0.6, so it's pretty hard to call that a bias number, 0.6 or higher. Which suggests, for most of the Western, Western world, a alpha maximum of somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. For Australia, we have a higher alpha, it means about 45 percent. Yeah, just shut up. Obviously, this is a change. I mean, in some countries where, for say, debt penalty, that would have some effect on the alpha curve. The debt penalty, yes. you mean debt penalty on tax evasion? Yes. Well, yes, the, the, the degrees of enforcement do that. But yeah. uh, places with a debt penalty tend to be less developed countries. Less developed countries actually tend to have worse enforcement and higher elasticity. Easy to get away with, especially if you're paying the son of the dictator, right? Which is normally what's happening if you're trying to hide money in that LDC. Um, yeah, so the, the UK gave yeah, us a wonderful example that seemed to reinforce what we already know. The lack of maximum is probably somewhere between 40 and 60. So, knowing that, knowing an elasticity is approximately 0.6, you know, we're, we're being nice, that's the number from the left wing tax economists. Uh, we know what the, the alpha stat is for Australia, that just falls out of the statistics from the ATO. We can now do a little Experiment, which is where is it? It's 35. Aha! This question I put in the, uh, in the exam for an advanced micro subject this year. Uh, yeah. I don't know if half of them got it because most of them were Australian students, but I also don't know if they kind of clued as to what the relevance was. But imagine a hypothetical story where a country called Australia had a tax base of $50 billion, which is roughly what it is. And in this hypothetical country, the government considers increasing it from 47 to 49%. Based on the information we have about elasticities, and it's fairly robust information, and tax stats, we can work this out. And it's not voodoo, it's not wishful thinking, it's, it's actually just maths. Uh, so what happens is the tax base goes down to $2.3 billion, that's GDP basically. GDP shrinks. Uh, if you have an extra 2%, so you have $50 billion, and then you increase the tax rate by 2%, Static analysis will tell you you get 2% of 50, right? You with me so far? 2% of 50. So you get a billion dollars. Guess what the uh, Treasury budget says this will raise? A billion dollars. Per year, right? I mean, they've added up three years. <laughs> they've said it'll raise $1.1 billion per year. So, you know, it looks, it kind of looks like they're doing static analysis to me. Right? <laughs> Either that or they're doing my analysis and then doubling it or tripling it. I don't know. But anyway, if you then factor in, this is the static <coughs> right? This is the idiot answer, which is what Treasury's got. If you understand that people change their behaviour, that falls straight out of the common elasticity, you actually lose 1.1 billion. So you gain a billion, you lose 1.1 billion. I mean, this shouldn't be too hard. Why are these people getting jobs at Treasury? 1 minus 1.1 equals we lose money. So this is the tax reform Australia is looking to bring in to get extra revenue from rich people. And based on elasticity data coming from left-wing tax economists, we lose money. If you take the elasticity numbers that come out of Cato, this would be like negative two billion. 
I'm taking nice numbers here. I'm out of time, aren't I? Almost. All right. Um, one little thing on the side, of course, GDP goes down. Who really cares about GDP? It's just a number. Think about the implication of that, though. It means less investment, less, means less money for charity, it means less consumer surplus. These are things we care about. But the reality is, is when you write a story, the newspaper just puts the GDP number up. Um, all right, so the last thing here is I wanted to touch on the consequence of this. I mean, I hope you're, if you've stuck with me so far, and I'm happy going a little fast, but if you've stuck with me so far, you should notice the important consequence from this is basically we can't leave the rich anymore in this country. It's not that we shouldn't. Perhaps we should. Perhaps they're all assholes and they all should give us all their money. But we can't. I mean, the Laffer Curve is not something we choose. It's, we didn't go, geez, I wish we had the Laffer Curve there. It just falls out of the elasticity of taxable income. So this, we've got a choice about where we put tax. We don't have a choice about where the elasticity is. Uh, well, we do long term, but that's a, that topic's a bit too nuanced to do in one minute. Uh, so, we've got a budget deficit. You guys may have noticed. as in most Western countries. Then uh, you guys may have heard what a, what a harsh budget we had recently. You know how the old version of the budget projected a $34 billion deficit. And they have slashed and burned that deficit so far down that now it's $30 billion. <laughs> All right, so if you look at this problem, some people say, yeah, it's legit, it's a problem long term. Even Gittin suggests it's a problem long term. It's really only people like Stiglitz who don't get it. Um, <laughs> to be fair to the guy, he's only got a Nobel Prize. So. <laughs> but nearly everyone has said there's a problem long term with these budgets. Maybe not short term. Our debt isn't that high today, but debt only gets higher because it started low and then you ignored it for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, so we don't have a problem today, but if we have 30, 40, 50 billion dollar deficits every year, then we're going to have a problem. So what is the solution? Now if you don't want to cut spending, which is what I, I prefer to do, and what I guess half this room or more would like to do, I hope. Uh, the most obvious thing to do is say we should tax more, right? Especially mm -hmm. tax the rich. It's the most cliche, obvious, easy thing to do. Because the rich are never in the room when we're talking about them either. Oh, I think I'm about to Sell everything. A far sell. That doesn't help your budget. Uh, privatizations don't help your budget. And also, the whole, the, this is another discussion to have. But uh, people who sell privatization on the basis of it helping the budget, I think are really undermining the debate long term. Well, it's, it's a one off hit. The next year, you've still got a budget deficit. You haven't fixed anything fundamental, so you haven't actually solved the underlying problem. And you're selling privatization for the wrong reason. The reason to privatize assets isn't to give the government money. It should be that we think it's better run in private hands. So I, I'm a fan of actually just giving away public assets to everyone on the electoral roll or everyone, and I know Lee wants it to just give away the public assets to everyone who works at that place. Sure, whatever you do, just get it out of government hands, raise no money, and then fix the budget in a proper structural way. But anyway, the point of this is the easy thing to do in your mind is just tax the rich. But this should give us some pause for thought, right? The Laffer maximum is about between 40 and 60, I think closer to 40, if you think closer to 65. But the point is once you get close to the Laffer maximum, you're not really raising much more revenue anyway. We just got nowhere to go. If the top marginal tax rate was 20% and you said tax the rich, you know, I can take you seriously. But we're already, if we're not at the Laffer maximum, and these stats suggest we are, but if we're not at it, we're close to it. If you had the most dramatically high Laffer maximum you could think of for Australia, and then took us there, would raise like an extra billion or two. It's a $30 billion deficit. So there's only two solutions to this. There's only two solutions to the budget deficit and the budget problem in Australia and around the Western world. And that is we either cut spending or we start taxing ordinary people. And that second one is implicitly what anyone who is saying they don't want to cut spending, that's implicitly what they're arguing. They'll say, oh, no, I just want to tax the rich. But that's bullshit, right? It doesn't work out. The maths doesn't add up. And if you look at what the French did closely when they increased the top marginal rate tax rate, on the rich to 75%, they also massively increase the tax on everyone else. Just not quite as much. And I thought it was, you know, it's potentially a brilliant piece of political theatre, because the top marginal tax rate is no longer about raising revenue, and everyone knows it now. It's just about looking like you hate the rich, because that helps you to get elected. And if you can look like you hate the rich enough, then you can actually take the money off the poor people, and they won't spill too bad. And that's what the French are doing, right? They're wrapping up taxes on everyone. Exactly They're just saying, look over here, look at this. It's exactly what the, well, in my opinion, it's exactly what the Liberals are doing. Either they don't understand the maths, in which case, you know, that's embarrassing and they shouldn't be in government, or they do understand the maths, 
They know it's not going to raise revenue, and they just want to be seen publicly to kick a rich person because it allows them to go and do something else. But it, it's, it's a dangerous strategy, but let's put the politics aside and say that we understand the choices available, and that is we either cut spending, as the Liberal government is not doing, but should be doing, or we start taxing the poor. And when you see it through that, those you see the choice through those eyes, it's no longer clear that we are the bad guys, right? <laughs> I don't think we are. So thank you for that. If you have more questions about any angle of tax, I'm happy to try. I think we have like one or two questions. So yeah. Oh yeah, well, what well, time is the not like credit rating and seeking to um, declare our element of debt to like junk level status? Do you reckon you will force the government to improve its um, bottom line? You say, what if they did? Yeah. Um, that's a bit of a weird question, saying what, what if they put our bonds to junk status even though they're not? Because I think if they did that, then they would probably just lose business to all the rating agencies, people who aren't insane. Because our bonds aren't junk at the moment. Well, it's been declined for the last six years. I mean, no one's making repayments, so I guess that's not right. Most Western countries are still making repayments on their bonds. Australia still lives. There's no, there's no realistic chance of Australia defaulting on our bonds in the next 5, 10, probably even 15 years without a crisis. Well, oh, well, Argentina pays the highest spread than we do. Okay, Australia does not have a short-term budget problem. I'm oh, sorry, it does not have a short-term debt problem. But don't let that sentence dissuade you from trying to fix the problem, right? Because if we wait until it blows up, we've waited too long. And the whole point is, of course, we don't have a debt crisis yet. The reason Greece has a debt crisis is they didn't have one at one point in time, and then they said, oh, we don't have one, so we'll ignore it. And then they got one, right? So we need to fix it before it happens. Just a quick one. What's... Um Based upon those numbers, what's the longest possible time you can keep doing the exact same thing and not have it fall to shit? I mean, what, what, what year is it that... Um, uh, I don't have these numbers up here. That's a kind of a different question going into the stability of debt. And, and it's actually, it depends on a lot of stuff, including on what you think the future ability to uh, to bleed the population is going to be, and especially on your estimates about the aging population. I did a rough estimate a while ago saying on, on just no change to policy, uh, Australia will go bankrupt around 2050, 2060, which will be like one of the last countries, and that assumes no change. So we've got a long time to be able to fix our policies if we want. But uh, whether we would just want to keep going towards a cliff. It also assumes there's no new spending programs though before 2050. Yeah, but, but I mean you have to make some fine assumptions about productivity too. <laughs> We're still decades away from the country imploding. But, you know, it would be nice to just not have the country imploding. I mean, that's another <laughs> <laughs> Let's just not go down the path that is unsustainable. <laughs> Alright, uh, we have one more, one more question. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, talked about that uh, the main reason the lack of code exists is because rich people are just hide their money. Um, Sorry, I, no, 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 well, there's five, I've got five reasons, and they're all true. Yeah, so um, how well would uh, Piketty's solution work of having like a 70% all around the globe tax on the rich? Well, that, that uh, global taxes have all been suggested by more than just Piketty. Um, I mean, it's a common theme from the heart left. Uh, Global taxes decreases one of those five behavioural responses. One of those five behavioural responses was jurisdictional change. So you move to the country with the lowest taxes. If, if every country had the exact same taxes, moving wouldn't help. But that, uh, if, if you block off one of the behavioural changes, you actually increase the incentive to pursue all the other four behavioural changes. Higher incentive to minimise, higher incentive to evade, higher incentive to change your career, higher incentive to change your labour supply. So there are various things you can do to modify the elasticity, such as create a global government, uh, global government with stormtroopers who have a person inside the room of each of the house. It'll change the elasticity, but you can never get rid of it. Okay, thank you very much.